Hey guys, Sherilyn Ross here. I am here to share with you guys a message that a lot of women, a lot of wives have been asking me to, to do. And so I'm starting. I'm not going to procrastinate, but I'm going to start. Um, this message is the, for women who are married. They've been, whether you've been married for two years or you're about to be empty nesters or you are empty nesters. A lot of women are, are seem to be, as they're personally growing in the Lord and as, as they get knowledge and information about um, you know, what marriage should be like, how they should be treated as a wife and, you know, what their family should look like as they're starting to grow, they're realizing that they don't have that yet. Um, they don't, the blessed marriage that God promised, and they're looking at other people's um, relationships and seeing that the relationships are doing well, but they look into their own marriage and relationship and they see that that's not what's going on for them. And they desire the best for God. And a lot of these women, they decided that they would come go for counseling. But the, what they'll find is that their husbands are not in into counseling, don't want to counsel. They're actually um, okay in their dysfunction, or they just don't want to change. They figure that the that the wife should just um, be relaxed, relax, and listen to them. Because if they just if my wife would just listen to me, then everything will work out. And basically, what that husband is saying is that I just want to control the situation and not grow, and I just don't want to be bothered. I don't want to do my job, so let me be lazy. So um, in this case, the woman is now seeking, um, you know, she's seeking solutions. She wants um, her marriage to heal. She wants her children to have the best. She even wants her husband to live out his purpose because she believes that there's more inside of him and she knows that they can do better together as a couple. And so um, then they have um, wives who their husbands are just um, distracted. They're just not into anything. They're not involved. They're uninvolved in the children's life. They're uninvolved in their marriage. Marriage. They're not. They're not romantic. They're not even helping out. They're just going through, just like a um, like a brute or a caveman, and they expect that they were just gonna live out this caveman kind of attitude. And the woman, the wife, wants more, and so she's feeling like she's stuck in a loveless marriage. And then she is pursuing help, like she's growing personally. She's asking him to read books with her, look at videos with her, uh, go to marriage and counseling, but he doesn't want to. That's the wife I'm speaking to today. This message is for you. There's also the wife that their husband is just flirtatious and he's just, um, he's not, he's not faithful basically. And he's very disrespectful, this very dishonoring kind of chauvinistic and, and, and sexist in a lot, in a lot of ways. And he just expects her not to be, not to be offended and just, um, line up with what he's doing. Um, he's become, being very immoral in his behavior and he just wants, you know, and it could be that both of you guys started your relationship on the foundation of immor immorality and he's continuing. And then now you, the wife has been growing, you're, you're now saved and you're growing and now you you want what the, be the best God has for you. And so you want to know how can I, um, what, what can I do to get my husband to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior so that we can both come on the same page and grow in the Lord. This message is for you. Good morning, Marilyn. Then there's a wife with you and your husband. Your husband might be in the church. He might be a leader in the church, but he still has certain caveman tendencies. You know, he could be immoral. He's probably dominant um, in terms of his mindset. He, he feel that he knows a lot and there's nothing that he can, you can teach him because of course you know he think he's he's God's gift to to man, mankind and he's God's favorite so he don't have to change or transform because he might be a leader in a church he might be a pastor he might be a deacon and so he's not thinking that he needs to change he feels like the church is his his wife and not his real wife and so I'm talking to the wife that's in a situation that wants change also there might be a wife right now her husband is not saved and um and he's kind of jealous of her relationship with God and she wants the same thing for him and so now they're going along in their marriage and she is trying to help him try to show him things he listens sometimes but he doesn't really um agree there's argument in the home where God is concerned and then she is feeling like you know what how can when when can we have this God ordained marriage? This marriage where both of us love the Lord, are, are um, obedient to the Lord, and living out our purpose to the Lord, and so helping our children do the same. You know, you just want the best mar um, best for God. God has for you. I'm speak. This message is going to be for you. And then there's probably someone your marriage. It seems like the love is out of it, and you can't get along. You every t every two every word is an argument. There is there is tension. There is like you 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 cannot get along every 
conversation ends in an argument and there's a lot of silent treatment going on and you the wife you don't want you've had enough and you want to be able to to save your marriage you know you love your husband still you know he still love you but you guys don't know how to just what to do you know for sure that there is an anti-marriage spirit manifesting and and doing its work in your home and you started you even started fasting and praying you're getting all the information from um, great teachers like kevin la ewing and um um, you call one of my favorites is uh is Jimmy Evans and and many other spiritual leaders um and you're you're like you know what I'm doing these things but I'm praying and fasting but I don't see any change this message is for you I am not an expert but what I am is someone that have gone through everything and also I forgot to mention those women who may have been in a who may be in abusive situation you know that your husband he just can't help himself and he's probably addicted to alcohol. He might, might be abusing substances or he's just have um, anger issues. He just um, the anger is too much and it's it's affecting your 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 marriage. And you might be in a marriage where um, you might need to separate for some time, but you want to build your your marriage. You he still wants his marriage. He loves you, but he don't know how to control these addictions or these um, um, harmful behaviors. And so you're you're he wants to work work on his marriage but you're in a separate situation where you're i mean you're separated but you're building or working on your relationship from distance right and and then but you want to know as a wife what can i do to speed it up or what can i do to help him while he's getting the necessary help that he's needing i'm speaking to that wife as well and also a wife that's in a marriage where your husband is and he has a temper issue he's not laid hands on you he just he just gets eruption of anger every now and then and but you know he loves you but you know there's something going on with him this is also for you Right. And so basically it's for the wife who is in a situation in her marriage. She knows that her she loves her husband. She wants she's fighting for her marriage, but she don't know what to do to get her husband to come along the path. She want to be know how can I be the helper that God called me to be for my husband, even though he is not seem to be in, he doesn't seem to be responsive. I'm speaking to you. And also. If there's anything that I'm leave, leaving out, um, whatever it is, your situation, my goal is to help you today. What can you do as a wife in whatever the situation you're going through to partner with God to ensure that the perfect will of God concerning your marriage and your family come to come to fruition, that it, it, it's realized, right? And so it's going to be a series. Um, I'm just going to start today. Um, I have a message for day today, so I'm going to share. And then as God leads, I'm going to be talking about different, um, add more to the series, so to say, to help us along. Eventually, we're going to have to go on a fast together um, to be able to, to walk this out as to what that fast looked like and what that process looked like. Because there is a way we do the thing things. You know, there's a strategy. Just like I love the, the book, um, if you're not getting a copy of the, gotten a copy as yet, of the book by Kevin L.A. Ewing, um, prayers that work. Go ahead and get a copy for that because of that because that's going to be instrumental in the fast as well. And also, there's other prayers, um, scriptures as it pertains to your marriage that you will add in. But that that book gives a great frames our mind, retrains our mind on how we go before the Lord. We are actually lawyers when we go to the before the Lord. Lord, it's a case. We're going with a case. It's a courtroom when we're going petition. A lot of people think that it's some kind of emotional room we're going and we're crying, but it's a petition. We have to know the laws of God. We have to know our rights in the kingdom. And so when we approach the throne of God, we, pro we approach it from the confidence in Christ Jesus. And so that's going to be something later on. So let's go into it. Um, so basically, when... Um, my, my, our marriage, Jill and I married for 30, I'm sorry, together for 31 years and married for 20, I think 25, going on 25 years, right? Yeah, going on 25 years this year. And so 
we started our relationship very young in ignorance. I came from a, a foundation that was very faulty, both of us, but I came from a foundation that did not have marriage in a, or marriage or a good marriage or an example of a good marriage in, inside of it. I came from a single mom home. My mom was a single mom. My dad was nowhere. He comes and go as he want. He was, was one of those, um, neglectful dad i was talking today i was talking just this week and our children usually ask questions about you when you're growing up and it dawned on me that my father never said happy birthday i'm 35 i'm 45 years old and my father even to this day never told me happy birthday Sherilyn. and i was like wow could you believe that not never said happy birthday and so just to give you an idea from where i'm coming from as it um as it pertains to a husband or a father figure or um, um, a relationship between a husband and a wife should look like, not to mention that my mom was not married to him, right? And so that's the foundation I was coming from. And then Joel and I met at a very young age. At, the, at 14 years old, we were each other's world and we, we we just loved each other. It's like we're inseparable. There's no one that could come between Joel and Sherilyn. Right. And so we were we were just we just knew we were gonna get married. It wasn't even a I, um, it, it wasn't even a like a, a, a thought. There was no doubt because, and then soon as we became twenty years old, and we knew legally, thing they'll figure out how we how we can get married. We got married, right? Uh, because we knew that we were meant for each other. There was no way we weren't meant for each other. For example, we would go to pick up the phone and talk. Back then, you had the the phone that was uh, hooked up to the wall, and you go and you you. The, the 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 phone with the lights on it and we will call each other when we go to pick up the phone when i pick it up he's on the line and sometimes he go to pick up the phone and i'm on the line it happened a lot of times it probably several times a month when we were when we were just um beginning and it happened often so we were like you know what we were meant for each other we thought about thought about each other we thought the same kind of things we believed the same kind of things we were the same thought process mindset um you know if anyone came to to us about something we would just look at each other because we were back to back against the world kind of from from when we were young right so you could not come between Joel and Sherilyn and so we were we just we were just really really in love with each other not only in the heart way but we dreamt together we set goals together we knew what we wanted to do together we started a business at the age of 19 and 20 together and we just worked and sacrificed we were operating you know like husband and wife even for, be, prior to us getting married we pooled our resources we add value to each other we plan together you know all these things when people when, I, when my brothers and sisters came they looked to me and, and Joel as, as their mother and father because we were that much older than my, my sisters and my brother and they just looked to us as a mother and father and we were that protection for them. We took care of them like we were their, the mother and father. So basically, we were just always locked together. Just to give you an, an idea, now as soon as we got married, right guys well before prior to getting married we did have some dysfunctional behaviors in the way we spoke to each other and and joel was very aggressive and joel was very violent right but again my personality i'm not moved by anything he could act up all you want it's not bothering me you know so i figured it was okay because i know i love him and you know I could handle myself, so I didn't pay attention to it. And I always found a way for Joel to get away with stuff, which I didn't think about it. I'm going to explain that later on. Because I said, okay, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, you know, you could carry it. Because I love him, and I figured I didn't take him that seriously, so I just let him get away with it. But it came back to bite me in the end because I was training him, and that's going to make sense later on. Anyway, so now we get married, and so life situations start coming at us because running a company and um, dealing with so many people and have to make major decisions. We run a company that eventually did about quarter of a million in sales every month. And we were, we were, um, we were leading people. We were influencing people, helping people, training people on a regular basis at, at this this young age right we didn't see it as young we were just looking at it as taking on the world i worked in um in corporate america on wall street actually in the world financial center that was close to to um the um world trade center and he worked for g financials in in jersey city and so you know we were just 
having these jobs so we can fuel our real passion, which was business, right? Anyway, when we got married, guys, then everything, I mean, married, and then we started, um, we had our business, and then we started having children, and then things started becoming worse and worse. Joel's temper took over, and Joel was very violent, very aggressive with his words. I mean, he would curse at me. He did that before, um, before we got married, but not to this extent. I just, I just forgave him like i said i like i said i i had him get away with it before and he knew i had low tolerance for um cursing in fact i told him people who curse they don't have a brain they're not smart right and that's what i told him and of course he had that mindset and every now when he cursed at me because he couldn't control his um his mouth he now assumed that I thought I was better than him. And again, he felt emasculated because I would just look at him when he says it and I wouldn't answer and I would turn my eyes because in my mind, you are behaving like an ignorant fool. You know, your words, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not, um, you're not smart doing what you, you do. And, and that came off of me. And so that made him even more angry, right? Because now it is my wife is not taking me seriously. Um, she's looking at me as if I can't even provide, I can't really lead her. She probably has everything. Um, and I was very decisive and I was very, um, I was disciplined and very and an, uh, a driver. So I would just say, okay, whatever, Joel. And I would go. So I wouldn't take him seriously. And his emotions, I didn't val validate his emotion and didn't validate um, him trying to express my um, himself because I figured that he'll get over it just like I when he said something harsh to me I got over it like and I figured that you're a guy you're gonna get over it too but again I did not understand hi Cheryl Trinidad in the house <laughs> welcome welcome and so basically um I didn't really see that anything was the was an issue so in our marriage, as it starts to go, you know, it became so violent and so, you know, unsafe that um, we started getting financial challenges. We, um, a lot of financial challenges. We were building this business and it seemed like as much, as much money we were making, there was much, but more money had, was going out, um, you know, so there was stress about that <coughs> and managing money. Um, the other thing was also um, our uh, words. I didn't speak negative things to him. I stayed silent. So the silent treatment I gave, but he, his words were very vicious. Again, profanity. He would tell me things, um, you know, about myself, which, you know, maybe may have been true, but it was very nasty, very disrespectful. Um, you know, and then he was physically physical. So he threw me out of the car probably two or three times in our, in our, our young age, but just with ang like, get up, get the, F out my car and that type of stuff. So it was not pretty. This is Joel and Sherilyn. Yes, Minister Joel and Sherilyn. This was us in our early 20s. Um, one of the times that I got thrown out of the car, I was pregnant, right? And so basically, you know, it was that, that's kind of the turmoil that was in our relationship. And of course, my eyes and my, I didn't speak much. I just withhold i didn't say anything but i was very arrogant and very proud and that's not good we know that the number one need for a man is to be be uh feel honored and i was the master the mistress of dishonor if you disrespect me you dishonor me you don't even deserve the, the to be in the in the space of the air that i breathe and i would just turn away and i would go away and that was the arrogance in which i carried and comport myself i was mincing around in pride right so when he is trying to say Sherilyn pay attention I'm just trying to communicate I'm not having a good day I'm like chuck it up buddy you're a man just do it right you know why are you complaining because I'm dealing with the same thing and I'm handling it and not on my handling business but I'm also handling my emotions and our children at the same time so again that's where we came from also, you know, it, it came to a point where he didn't want to have anything to do with me and God because and, and, and then I started growing in a certain way because I figured, you know what, I don't deserve this kind of treatment. You know, I do not deserve this treatment. I could do much better than him. In fact, I, you know, I was offered to marry like two other guys before wanted to marry me. And at, at that time, I was like, you know what? In my mind, you know what? Though I didn't love those guys, I didn't even care about them. Um, they were like, if I dealt with them, it was me going lower. 
you know, just, just basically accepting and settling for. And at that point, we were so low in our marriage. Like I was like, maybe I should have just settled with this one and this one, right? But again, that was the enemy, of course. So that's the place. We were in a low place, in a place of just where are we going to go? So then I was, I was like, I know there's no one for me, but my husband, I saw Joe as an incredible leader. He's phenomenal with people. I learned how to deal with people. Anytime I needed something to understand something, I went to my husband. I could read a whole half of a book. My husband would read two sentences in a book and he would bring such revelation. So I loved learning from him. And I'm like, this is my husband. So why can't we get along? You know, the I, divorce wasn't even a thought. So I know like, you know what, there's something that I have to do. Is there something I'm doing? So I started a, 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 a vicious um, um, self healing or um, helping my, like, I wanted to be better. Self-improvement, that's the word, self-improvement. I wanted to be better because I took everything he started saying about me and I said, could this these things be true? They're probably true. So I would go, I would watch at that time, um, Oprah Winfrey um, and I would read a lot of books and stuff like that. A lot of Oprah's stuff was not good anyway. I tried them and they worked for a little bit and then they just went away. And then I read other books and I read things online and then I did it for a little bit and then it just disappeared until I was such, my back was such against the wall, though I, accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior uh, at the age of 20. I think I was around 24 at this time, four years later. And I knew that, you know what? I have to go to the word of God. I, God, I need you. I cried out to God. And then I know it was the spirit of the Lord now that led me to his word to read. And this is the foundation of scripture that began my process of healing. And I'm going to read that right now. You guys still there? <laughs> Can you guys believe this? You know, anyway, so um, my foundation of scripture for my, my, my healing process, and I'm going to share you guys what I've went through and what I've learned. And it's for you to ask the Holy Spirit to what, based on what I say, say, what I say today in this message, what is it that Sherilyn is saying that applies to me and help me to understand and appropriate to my situation if it applies? And so basically, 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, that 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, if anyone's there, you can put it in the chat. But the, my foundational scripture that, uh, that led me in my process to fight for my marriage and fight for my husband and children, well, um, and for my children was basically this scripture. So 2 Corinthians 12, and it began at verse 7, and I'm going to read. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I, I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm made strong. So let me make some sense of that. Um, sense of that. So basically, how does it apply to me? In this point, I want to give you guys where I was. At that time, I was praying to God, right? I wasn't fasting yet, but I was praying so much every day and I was crying. I was a stay-at-home mom. So when I was with the children and I put them to sleep, I would think of my marriage and I would get greatly depressed and saddened. And I felt alone because at that time I wasn't talking. Um, um, <laughs> Hi, Charlene. That time I didn't have any girlfriends and I, I'm, I would not have shared anything with them anyway, because it would have been a sign of failure or shame for me. Why? Because at that time, everyone thought that Joel and I had the perfect mom relationship. A lot of people were jealous and they would love to hear that it was not working out. So I wasn't about to go and tell anyone that things weren't working out or I wasn't um, happy in my marriage at that time. But the thing is, Joel and I would have bouts of joy. So it's not like I was depressed all the time. It comes to certain time uh, points in a month or maybe every three months where, where we would just melt down and it would be a place of just um, doldrum for us for a few weeks or so. But we always had like moments of, we were always accomplishing things, doing things, happy with our children. But then we would, we would, with the time would just remind, remind us of, you know what, we really don't have true intimacy at this point. And um, why don't we like each other at this point? 
And so I was in this place of God, please help me, help me, you know, uh, because I was growing spiritually. I was reading books and, and I was I was understanding uh, that both Joel and I were at fault. And the fact that the where we were at fault is the fact that we did not have knowledge. We did not have understanding. And so I just wanted to share with Joel some of the things. So I would share articles. I would share videos. And he would not listen to it. He don't want to be bothered. You know, so I would be the one gathering information, growing, and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, and anytime I shared something or in that time, if, if I told him about something I saw with another couple, he he would just reject it or whatever. He don't want to be bothered with it. So I felt hopeless. Like every one of my attempt to be a good helper, to help my, my husband, for both of us to grow together, not saying that I was perfect, but I just want him, both of us to realize that, you know what, let us grow together because we are both dysfunctional. Joel didn't want to have anything to do with it. In fact, he tell me, oh, you think you know more than anything? You know, you 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 think that um, you know everything and even more. Again, he resisted me because he said, like, not, you know, not only are you um, prideful, but now you're telling me, you know, everything. Sherilyn always know everything. So that wasn't even a good thing for me. So now I went to God crying and they give me Second Corinthians 12. Right. Hi, Melissa. Um, 12 and 7. And then here it says, uh, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation. At that point, I started getting a lot of revelation of the broken parts in my marriage and the broken parts in our relationship. Right. I saw where we Joel and I was missing it and we didn't have what it is um, that took for a marriage to succeed. And this is why I was going to him. But um, I was getting a lot of revelation, but my husband was not. And here I am, I'm going to be the one that seems to be having to carry the marriage. So I was patient with him. I was respectful, though he was not respectful. I would submit, even though he would just seem like, you know what, he's just lording over me. Um, you know, he was just being still angry, the, the Joel, the controlling, the chauvinist, all that stuff. And I was just submitting. And, and I, um, I submitted because the Bible told me to submit. Um, I was growing myself because God said, do not be uh, confirmed to this world, but be ye transformed to, to the renewal of your mind. So I was in the Bible. And again, I was feeling like verse seven in second Corinthians 12, unless I should exalt a be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. So the information and knowledge and my eyes being open was like a thorn in my flesh that I'm seeing what is going on wrong with my, my, my marriage. And now I have a lot of information that could help us, but my husband is not, don't want, he's not interested. He's just blocking me every way. So my marriage seemed to be a thorn in my flesh. The fact that I had this knowledge of how we can improve. And it was like a thorn. I have to, and also, so I have to do these things. Like I was submitting. I had to watch my tongue. And I used to bite my tongue a lot. I mean, I have holes in my tongue because I had to humble myself a lot. I had to, you know, um, forgive my husband just like every 10 minutes, right? I had to forgive him, you know, because I would not harbor anything. Um, that's a natural thing about me. I forgive easy. You know, I don't bother with people. I just forgive easy. But I was, oh, it was better for me. It was hard because it's my best friend doing this to me. But then I still had to now bite my tongue. tongue. I thought that he should understand, Joe, we have the same mind. So I thought, but he didn't. I had to carry this. There was given to me a thorn in my flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me and buffet me to strike with a blow. Right. So um, the messenger of Satan. So like it's the demons. Right. They were um, the spirit. Satan was just buffet me, hitting me over and over. So every time I do something good concerning uh, me being humble, me being kind, me being generous, me not keeping record of wrong, everything that I was demonstrating as the Holy Spirit was teaching me concerning my marriage, I was still being um not not being honored, not being respected, not being loved. Joel didn't want to, it seemed like Joel didn't want to hear anything. And a lot of times it got worse. It got worse. And so um, like the scripture saying, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, as you right now, ladies, you're growing and you're getting um, information. You know what's wrong in your marriage. However, your husband is not there. It's going to be like um, part B of um, second uh, Corinthians 12 and seven. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, right? So you feel like a thorn in your flesh. The messenger of Satan buffets you, strikes you. Satan is striking you over and over. Lest 
I be exalted above measure, right? For this, for this thing, I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So a lot of times I'm like, God, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. This is too much. My, my emotions are drained. I'm crying so much. Like I don't have any more tears to cry. My eyes are puffy. Why me? Why me? God, please. It's pain is too much. I can't deal with this. I don't know what to do. You know, all this are crying. So because I was feeling like my soul was being afflicted, it was such a burden. Right. And so for this thing, I saw the Lord's Christ and I went to God over and over because he's the only one. I wasn't going to go to my mother and I was not going to my family or friends right i wanted the pain to go away i a lot of times i remember sitting down and said god can you just take me out of of life of, of life for a little bit and hang out with you and just get me refreshed a little bit and then put me back in the situation to fight so long so many times i wanted to escape not kill myself but escape out of the emotion out of the situation out of the the marriage and, and everyone i just wanted to be taken with god where there was no pain no stress no issues and let him love on me and renew me and then put me back in a situation so i could fight but there was no relenting right it seems sometimes it, get, it got so hard and worse and worse Right. For this thing, I saw the Lord that it might depart from me. Verse nine. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, the grace of God is sufficient for thee. I'm going to explain that grace. Because when I heard when God said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Right. I was like, I don't understand why you're saying your grace, Father God, is sufficient to me. I don't need your grace right now, God. You know, um, you know, I just want you to come in here and fix it. You know, come and talk to Joel. Tell him what to do. You know, you are all powerful. Come and speak to his mind. Touch his mind. Like back in the days, the miracles and wonders. Let it let him wake up one day and he just be like, Oh, Sherilyn, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done. And then he started doing everything that I thought that he could do. And I don't have to go through nothing. You know, it's a, I thought that my crying to God was enough. My fasting and praying and me humbling was enough, right? Good morning, Shelly. Welcome. Right. And I thought, you know, why? I, I have to clean, cook, take care of three children. I mean, and run a business. Isn't this enough? Why do I have to carry all this? And aren't I the weaker sex, Lord? Because I'm the weaker vessel and you have me carrying all this. Ain't he supposed to lead God? He's the head. I'm not the head. He's the head. Why, why do I have to bear this? So again, I did a lot of crying out. And God was saying to me, always in whisper, the Holy Spirit says, my grace is sufficient. I'm like, I don't really understand what that means, Holy Spirit. So every time I was going through something, Holy Spirit will tell me, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. So I have to say, God, Holy Spirit, please tell me what that means. Because I don't know what it means. Because right now, all I'm feeling is the pain and the lack and the unhappiness and the tiredness and the frustration and the stress. And I don't know why, why do I need grace from you at this point? So God was saying, grace is a gift that God gives to us, right? God is the grace is a gift that God gives to us that we don't deserve. Right? So mercy is the punishment that we deserve that God does not afflict on us. He does not give us the punishment we deserve for our own actions. Grace is a gift that is given to us that we do not marry or we do not deserve. And I'm like, God, why is it that your grace is sufficient for me? I'm not doing anything bad. <laughs> he is. <laughs> Don't you see me submitting here and holding my tongue and taking care of the children and all this stuff? I'm doing my work, but he's not leading. He's not doing this, right? <laughs> And so God, why do I need grace? He needs grace. I don't need no grace. I'm doing the right thing, right? And God is telling me my grace is sufficient. Then I started to look at myself and he says, uh, for my strength is made. And the other part of that is my strength is made perfect in weakness. So what is indicating to me that I was in a weak place and not weak in that I didn't have the ability to uh, persist in my marriage, but in a, I was weak spiritually. Because if I was strong spiritually, I would know the, special, the, the words to say, and I would have also understood what the enemy was doing, and it would have amped me up like it does today to be able to go after what it is the enemy was telling me. 
So God wanted me in that moment to get very good, get strong. My spirit man needed to be strong. Not my flesh or my soul and knowledge and, and my, my, my will and my intellect, but my spirit man was so weak. So God was being patient in me, knowing that I was in ignorance. I did not know how to be a wife. I did not know how to be a woman. I did not know how to be a mom. I did not even know how to be a daughter of Christ. I did not know none of those things. And here I am complaining because the things that, and I'm going to go into all of them um, make more sense in scripture. He was showing me that, Sherilyn, you need to grow. You need to grow. You are in a weak place. Your spirit man is weak. And so therefore, because you are in a weak place, I want my grace is sufficient that you don't get destroyed right now. I have enough in my hands to basically take you out of this world. I have enough in my hands. The Satan is accusing you of so much things right now from your ancestors. And of course, I, I'm telling you, I'm 24. I know nothing about the spiritual realm. I learned about the spiritual realm at 39 years old. This is 24 years. And God is saying his grace is sufficient for me. And really it was because I was so much things that he had the right to take me out, take my husband out, take my children out. It could have been worse for me in this situation. But all I was seeing, I was right in this, in this situation here and God's grace was sufficient. He was keeping me, right? And he wasn't answering me at that point because he knew that I needed to learn certain things. I need to grow. I was spiritually weak, as the Bible says. Most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my infirmity than the power than the power of Christ, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And this is um, Paul's wisdom that he says, "I should glory in my infirmity, so that the power of God of Christ would rest on me." And because I was in this place of infirmity and affliction and brokenness, God was working in me and growing me. And, and what I'm about to share with you guys, I could share with you knowing all confidence that once you do the word, the will of God, which is his word, you will be able to win the heart of your husband. You will be able to um, um, get, get your family be successful. You will have the marriage of your dream better than any persons in your history ever experienced, right? And so, and, and and setting the stage for your children to come. So basically, God is in his infinite wisdom. He was able to take me out of this place. So right now today, I get able to share with you guys what it is that I'm going to do. So I'm going to go in. Here's the process. God showed me in that scripture, my foundational scripture, to help me launch me into healing and launch me into helping save my marriage was 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to um, 10. And so let's go into my, um, my notes here. So basically, um, we are products of our environment. God was showing me that he had to transfer me and ch change me. He was saying that I was weak. My spirit man was weak because my my spirit man was a um was a reflection of my uh, or or I or Joel and I our marriage where we were was a product of our environment right and so what is environment right I'm gonna um I went through and I got a bunch of definition for environment to give us a holistic idea as best as I can. So that when I'm going for it, you're going to, in your mind, I want you to think environment, environment, environment. The reason why we're here is because of our environment. The reason why we will, we will, we will be better is be going to be because of our environment. So number one, environment, a person's social environment. So you think about your family marinade. You think about your friends right now that you keep. You think about the friends that your husband keep. You know, you, you think about the people that are around you, you know, your workplace, all the people, your social environment, right? Number two, a person means of doing something. A person's means of doing something. So based on our family marinade, tradition and culture, this is how we do things. We do things based on, we cannot do something that was not learned or put in our brain. And this is why it's so important. God said, I want you to, to learn new things. He wanted to transform me. He wanted Sherilyn to now spiritually grow because I did not have the right information inside me. So my environment, our place or type of surrounding. Environment is our place or type of surrounding. Our environment is a set of circumstances in which we find ourselves, a state of affair, of affairs, 
right? A set of circumstances in which we find ourselves in, a state of affairs, that's our environment. Our environment is also our background. Our environment is our background. Our environment is, is seen, is a scene which is a place where an incident occur. And I found that very interesting because in our in the different scenes in our past, we've uh, we've experienced a lot of traumatic in, um, incidents, right? Our, our spouse may not have revealed or even remember a lot of incidents in their life that caused them to make self vows or make decisions or you to make self vows and decisions that right now, it's a, the, the, that scene is speaking to your your current circumstances, and if not broken or real or or, or um, exposed and stopped, will speak to our um, future. What is environment? Environment is scenario which is a scenario which is framed, um, right? A framework, a storyline, structure, an outline, sequence of events, chains of events course of events, right? These are all our environment. So we have a framework, the framework in which we live our life. You know, a lot of us say we've already make a framework of what we think is best for us. We've had this storyline of what our family and our relationship and our children is to be like, both of both us and our husband. We've structured, outlined ourselves in a certain way that is contrary to God, Right? That's the, that's, the, that's the bottom line. What uh, what we structure is 99% contrary to God, you know? And then there's sequence of events, whether we plan it or not, or chains of events, an occurrence, um, course of events that's in our environment. Environment is location, which is the context of the circumstances that forms the setting for events to happen in our life. Um, whether it be um, ideas and terms in which it can be fully understand and access. So basically the, the context of the circumstances that forms the setting of events. So in our, in our life, right, there are certain contexts and certain circumstances, whether we are the one that frame it ourselves or it's been um, set to a core or been staged by our tradition, culture, parents, or the way we were thought, right? And a lot of times it's contrary to God's God's will because it's set in culture and, and, and tradition. Now, um, another um, explanation for environment is the climate, the atmosphere in which um, a pervading tone or mood of a place, right, or situation, so our climate. And then our ambiance, our environment in which we live, the environment in which we live. So our environment, we are a product of all these things. We are a product of our social events um, or a problem, the means of how we do things, uh, the storyline, how we structured our life. We're just a product of our environment. We are a product of the book and what, what forms our environment. The books we read, the people we associate with, and so on. So in essence, we are a product of the books we read, the friends or association we keep, the music we listen to, our family marinade, physically and spiritually, right? So whatever spiritually is going on in our ancestry and our, has been levied to us, that's, all, that's, that's, that's speaking to us right now. We are a product of that. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that was my case. When I was crying out to God, I didn't, I had lacked knowledge on marriage. I lacked knowledge as to why I was in that situation. Because remember my fav, one of my favorite scriptures, I always tell you guys, Proverbs 26, 2, a curse without a cause cannot alight. Means it can, um, we cannot have a curse in our life without permission or legal rights, right? God has to sanction it. He has to have a, there must be a basis for which this is to happen. It just don't just happen automatically. And at that time, when I was crying out, I thought I was innocent. You know, I didn't do anything but all this stuff happening to me, right? <laughs> so Joel and I had a perfect dysfunction. And we thought that, you know, it was cool. Like before we married, I knew we had some dysfunction, but I thought that was what made us, you know, don't worry about that. You know, we can handle it. I'm ready to rock and roll. I came from a dysfunctional family. Like we would talk over each other. And the higher the, um, the, the octane or the volume is the more fired up and you're leading the whole conversation. And that's how we spoke, but no one listened to one another. There was no, no place for intimacy to be formed. 
And here I am bringing this, this occasional um, association I would have my family where we having a good time roasting each other over speaking over each other. And now I'm bringing it into my marriage where my husband came from a peace, a, a peace loving family, a, a family that whispers, <laughs> you know, they talk very quietly, gently, soft, and everything is just very, you know, not too serious. Right. And here I am. He's coming to the he's coming to Shirley, man. We dysfunction was the way we lived. You know, we have to have some kind of dysfunction for things to work. We need some fiery something going on, right? So here we have these two things coming together to try to blend. It's not gonna work. And so Hosea 4, 6, so rightfully says, um, I was being destroyed for lack of knowledge. And it goes on to say, because you've rejected knowledge. And in that time, I'd, I'd rejected knowledge, right? I did not, um, I wasn't, wasn't comfortable in the process that God gave me. He kept leading me to things to do, but I'm stopping in the middle of it to complain. So in my process, I would stop to complain that it's not working and da-da-da, not knowing, again, because of lack of knowledge, when with the word that says, you know, death and life is the power of the tongue. So every time I stopped to complain, I was making a verbal um, expression of what wasn't happening and this power and life in my mouth. So now I'm a co-conspirator with Satan against my situation. So all the work that I've done, I'm undoing it with my own mouth. I hope that makes sense, right? And that was one of the things, because I reject knowledge. I didn't continue to read. And even if I read and listened to something, I was so caught up in my emotion of the injustice being to, being done to me that, um, again, and that's way, that's app operated in pride, right? Um, you know, I'm not demonstrating love. I'm being boastful. And the Bible says love is not boastful, self-seeking or prideful. But I was marinated in those things because why, when is it going to work for me? You know, I did X, Y, and Z. And God keep telling me again, my grace is sufficient. He's it's like kind, of, kind of like a warning. Like, you don't realize that you are on thin ice too. You know, why are you complaining to him? I want you to work on you because right now I have all this um, uh, uh, arrest warrants out for you, but I'm holding it. I'm extending my grace to you until you get the revelation you need to be able to help your husband and family, right? And so I also reject my priest, he said. He says, because of ignorance, he rejects his priest. So in that point, I was the priest of the home. And because I was rejecting knowledge and not going forward and complaining at that time, I was reject being rejected. And my behavior and my complaining was actually working against myself. So I'm disqualifying myself as the priest that I had to be at that time right? Just for the moment, operating in the office of a priest when you're interceding and praying and fasting for the health and the healing of your family or your husband. It went on to say in Hosea 4, 6, because you have ignored the laws of God, I also will ignore your children. And when I heard that part, I said, no, wait, 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 nobody in touching my children, right? But I'm the one standing in the way. And because of God's grace, God's grace. He said, my grace is sufficient, Sherilyn. And so when I saw and understood that, I said, you know what? I will not ignore the laws of God. So what are your laws, Father God? What does the law look like? Because I didn't know what laws were. And the Holy Spirit began to take me into the word to read. And I would read things. But of course, I would just read and to read. But then I started listening to Miles Monroe, who started unearthing some understanding, which told me, God's word are laws. So the things that he's saying, especially when Jesus spoke in red, it's a law, right? So I'm like, oh, so the part when it says I'm supposed to forgive, I forgive. Love those who hate hate you and spitefully, mis um, spitefully use you and speak all manner evil against you. You're supposed to forgive them and love them and pray for them. And here's my husband. He would always spitefully say things all manner evil against me, cussing me out, saying things that weren't true, accusing me of stuff, twisting my words, all these kind of things. And guess what? I'm supposed to say, I forgive you and I love you. And, and not only am I loving you, I'm going to pray for blessings on you. And not only that, I'm going to make sure I take care of everything that I'm called to take care of. You're going to get the best, most delicious food. Your home is going to always be in order. I'm going to train up our children, even though you're busy um, at work or whatever the case may be. 
your children are going to know that you are awesome and you're their dad and you deserve respect and honor. And I'm going to demonstrate that in front of all the time because it's the right thing to do because I fear God more than I fear you or anyone else. So I develop a fear of God from my um, working in my marriage. I feared God so much that whatever Joel did or said, I d it didn't phase me after a while because I knew that God had my back and he did indeed. And Proverbs 11, 9b says, our deliverance basically says, um, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. But what I want us to get from that is our deliverance is a pro um, is a process. It has to be a process because it started when I was, I started paying attention to, um, he wanted to heal my marriage around the age of 24 and my marriage probably healed when we probably moved here like what, 30 at the age of 30. So six years later. Right. So this, for me, I would say it was a process of six years for him to even want to come on the same page. And of course, there was still work to do. And we're constantly growing. Right. Um, knowing that our ignorance has caused us to be in this position we are in is very important. We need to know that we're in this position because of ignorance, lack of knowledge. Right. We are bearers of the seed sown in us. So whatever our ancestors lack, our mother and the father lack, they sowed it in us. So we were, we would, we were jacked up from the beginning. We were set up to fail from the beginning. And so Galatians, I'm sorry, Lamentations five seven says, our ancestors sin. Right? They had the dysfunctional marriage. They did all kinds of wickedness that gave open doors access for Satan to come and mess with our marriages, right? So what is going on with us? If we have the anti-marriage spirit, if there's any um, spirit of discord um, or stress and anxiety, a spirit of infirmity that wants to take us out through um, hypertension or, or getting a stroke, this was actually given, um, we may have been believers or living a righteous life. However, because of our ancestors' sin, there's legal rights or open doors that the kingdom of darkness had to our life, right? Both Joel's and both mine, both yours and your husband. So Lamentation 5 says, our ancestors sin and are no more, and we bear their punishment. You might say, Sherilyn, it's not fair. It really, it, really, it really is fair because God is a fair God. He's a just God. He wants us to learn and know his words and his grace is sufficient for us until we get to learn and know those laws, right? So therefore, we, 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 he's patient with us that we come to the point where we would learn the word and get the revelation so he won't afflict us anymore, right? So basically... We should be so great, gr uh, grateful to God for his grace because there's so we don't know what is what punishment is actually scheduled to come or how massive the, 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 the punishment was supposed to be. But God's grace has minimized the blow. Right. And so therefore, we have to understand whatever we sow, we will reap. So we may have sown things and, and we're reaping the rewards. And the thing is. Whatever we sow, we don't get exactly that. I mean, well, let me let me qualify the statement. We may think that um, we could say we might have been a bully in school or we may have stolen something when we were young or something that we did or we stole somebody's girlfriend or um, girlfriend or we talk a lie about somebody or slander someone when we were growing up and we thought it was just a little um, white lie or whatever the thing may be. But again, it's an open door. All the enemy wants, and I remember we talk about deliverance, the, uh, the enemy choose several ways to be able to open the door. All the kingdom darkness want is an open door. So they get the, the human, you and I, to, uh, to, to sin so that a door can open and then whoever wants to come in, come in. There's a whole bunch of right now, picture in your head right now, around you, a whole bunch of demons just waiting, waiting, like they're on their ready, set mark, waiting for you to break the laws of God or sin so that they go running quick. And we don't know who they are. Just like when you open a door, we don't get to say what bug or what comes in, right? We don't know what could come in. A ladybug could come in, a mosquito, a fly, um, ants. We don't get to choose the bug that comes in, right? A cat could run in, a dog, a stray dog, right? So we don't get to choose what come in, but all they care about is an access, an open door to us. So that lie that we did, that whatever we did, that slander that we did, that we thought was a little white lie, not a big deal. Guess what? 
open doors and things could come in to bring dysfunction to us, try to wreck, wreck, our, um, wreck our marriage, bring uh, cause us to behave in certain ways. We do not know what came in. So this is why I, um, this scripture is here, is that Galatians 6 and 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And so therefore, if it wasn't ancestral, according to Lamentation 5, 7, then it's because of our own actions out of ignorance and walking in sin, according to Galatians 6, 7. So all my point is, whatever is happening in your, in your marriage, whatever is going on right now, it had a legal right, either from your husband or from you, but it had a legal right to be there. But God is the answer, and he's wanting us to get the answer through knowledge. We have to get the knowledge, right, of what it is. So our own dysfunctions cause us to, to, to sow dysfunction. So based on the dysfunction that we came in with, so if we had the anti-marriage spirit from our ancestry, we're coming in with that anti-marriage spirit ready to rock and roll in our marriage. If our husband had that same spirit, he's coming in with it ready to rock and roll in our marriage. If there was fornication that happened that we had multiple partners before we finally got married, guess what? They're rocking and roll with their soul ties coming into our marriage. So that's classified as dysfunction right? Joel and I was very dysfunctional, very dis I came from dysfunction in terms of um, my mom parents were not married, right? And then my mother was a single mom doing everything on her own. My father didn't even acknowledge that he had a responsibility. You know, we didn't even hold him accountable. It was just so normal, you know, men just having women, children with women and just going away. And the women are there taking on the responsibility and doing everything as if it's normal. That is not normal. There's something wrong with our dads, right? If you're a product of that and he needs help, right? But of course, we're called to honor him and love him this, this right, um, despite. But my point is, a lot of us, we may be good, educated, um, Bible-believing, holy-filled um, Christians, but if we came from those kinds of situations, if we were a product of um, infidelity, if we fornicated prior to marriage, if our ancestry were were um, in concubinage and all kinds of um, all manner of um, polygamous relationships from culture, then guess what? We're coming in with dysfunction because it's spiritual right? And so dysfunction causes us to sow dysfunction. So now when we come in, both us and our husband coming in with our dysfunction, we come in to sow more dysfunction. It gets worse with the generation. It gets more because it's piling up higher and deeper unless somebody stops it and casts it out, um, end the road of um, dysfunction, right? So we sow that dysfunction. And then what happens also, in fact, when we, when we were born, if we had our own dysfunction separately, we're going to attract dysfunction. So dysfunction, we attract who we are, not what we want. We always attract who we want. So right there, we should we should end it in terms of saying, oh my gosh, why did I choose the wrong person or whatever the case may be? No, you didn't. You chose the right person because we attract who we are. We cannot attract what we, we're not. You know, we attract who we are, not who we want. And once we understand that principle and get it in our mind, you know, do not be deceived. Um, deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever we sow, we will reap. Whatever is sown into us, if there's dysfunction inside of us that was sown, whether it be, again, ancestral or based on our us walking in sin or living immoral lives, that dysfunction will attract dysfunction. All right. So now with that, I want to give us some education. First of all, I'm going to recommend that you guys get a book. Then this book is going to explain these dysfunctions. Did you know there's four dysfunctional husbands and four dysfunctional wives? I'm just going to list them for the sake of time, but we're going to go into more detail as to how these things affect us. Um, you know, the types of dysfunctional um, husbands and what caused them to be dysfunction and what can we do? This process. So when we go through the point of um, correcting these issues through fasting and praying, we have knowledge now that we're speaking to the dysfunction in our husband and we're casting using with the word of God. We're tearing down these things. But first, we have to have knowledge of these things. And so therefore, there's four dysfunctional husbands and there's four dysfunctional wives. And these dysfunctional husbands will always attract dysfunctional wives and vice versa. So our own dysfunction causes us to sow dysfunction and attract dysfunction or attract dysfunction and sow dysfunction, right? So what is the product? Dysfunction. Can God bless dysfunction? No, he can't, right? So here are the dysfunction. There's four dysfunctional husbands and I'm going to list them. 
You guys can put it in 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 um in the comments if you like. Um, so the number one, one, one dysfunctional husband is the dominant husband. This is a controlling husband. People will call him a narcissist. You know, he's controlled by the Jezebel spirit. And this kind of husband, usually their mother was a was 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 a Jezebel spirit person. The mother operate in, in a Jezebelic um, tendency or their husband, their father was a, um, was a, a chauvinist, right? He saw the father dominate the uh, mother, but mostly the dom most dominant husband, their mother was the one. The mother was the one that was dominant. The mother was the one that had the Jezebelic spirit or the narcissistic spirit. So you find dominant husbands. So number one, dominant husband. And we're going to go into details on another um, live. And I'm going to recommend a book at the end for everyone to read, right? And so passive husband. And these are your passive husbands. And these are your husbands that are kind of passive aggressive in nature. And so... <laughs> My husband used to be passive aggressive, right? Um, in 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 area areas, and again, can you see these things? Multiple things happen in your husband. Yes, but well, there's one that is dominant, right? So a passive husband is the type that he won't say nothing, he won't stand up for anything, he won't he won't make any decisions. He wants you to do everything. He wants you to to make all the decisions. He wants you to take care of everything administrative. He doesn't want to have a word to say. He has his comfort in you doing everything is like you're his mother right you want he wants you to just do everything for him he don't stand up he don't make decisions he don't discipline the children he agrees with the children he wants to be the friends of everybody every time you ask him something he agrees with you he doesn't have an opinion nothing and 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 this passive husband you could see you could, it, these women, some of these women, they married a husband and they like that. They think it's, oh, he's so sweet. He's so nice. And he's so whatever. But guess what? When they get married now, you want him to lead. You want him to stand up for you. You want him to defend your children. You want him to protect the house. And he's like, well, wait, I didn't sign up for this. And he's going to sleep a lot. He's not going to, he's going to go to work and come home and go sleep. Um, he's going to cry, be emotional. He's going to use passive aggressive tendencies towards you um, to shut down for, for, for moments at, at a time because he doesn't want to do anything. He's just a passive husband. And then you have an immoral husband. This is a husband that's a chauvinist, who is sexist, who, um, you know, he, he can't see a skirt. He's flirting with everybody. You know, he just wants to, he believed that it's okay to have side pieces, you know, because his mother, his father did it or whatever the case may be. It's just normal in culture. He's just immoral. You know, he likes to drink. He's, um, he likes to drink, gamble, all these kinds of things you know you're not considering the life the financial uh, security of the family he gambles you know he's addicted to certain things he has he just satisfy himself all the time and this is an immoral husband then you have the distracted husband and the distracted husband is the one that is he's concerned with everything else except his family so he's at the work, the job, everything from the bottom to the top to the job. He is all about, he's coming home, he's talking about the job. But when it comes to, you know, Tommy has a game coming up or our anniversary or a birthday, you know, oh, Oh man, I have this doing or some with distracted with friends, distracted with hobbies, distracted with work, distracted with ministry. Everything has his attention except his home. You know, and he always finds a way. And these husbands, they always find a way to protect their brokenness and their dysfunction, you know, um, because the demons that are working with them to make sure that they remain with it. The number one door closer or gatekeeper to their dysfunction is offense. So the minute you bring this up to the husband, they become very offended. Right. And the reason why they're dysfunctional is because they lack knowledge. And it isn't it amazing. The Bible says in. Scripture says that um, perfect peace have they that love thy law, love the laws, love the, the precept, you know, the commands of God, knowledge of God, the wisdom of God. And so perfect peace has they that love thy law and nothing by any means shall offend them. And so these individuals, because they lack knowledge, right, they don't have a peace about what they're doing and they're very, they get offended to protect their brokenness then you 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 need to know what kind of wife you are and though there's four different kinds of wives again these are dysfunctional they're destructive and dysfunctional 
um, types of wives and husbands. And so as a wife, um, are you a dominant wife? These are your controlling wife. You always got to be right. You have to be in control. The minute somebody go against your opinion, you all of a sudden get depressed. You know, you want to be able to just, you know, it's your way or the highway. You know, some women, they, they start to get emotional and the emotions is very real. This is why the deliverance is necessary. The emotions is real because you're getting helped by demons right so you it's not the the spirit of the person not the, the the spirit person that goes to heaven or a god forbid hell the spirit man which is the real man is not the one is they're being influenced by spirit spirit spirits right so let me be clear those the dysfunctional husband is that way because they are been they've been de demonized and they need deliverance and a dysfunctional wife is dysfunction because she's been demonized and she needs deliverance but nonetheless when we have issues in our marriages is because we are dysfunctional in some way so the dominant wife is the one that ought to be in control she manipulates situations to the point where maybe she gets emotional if she can't have her way i did all that for you and i can't believe that you blah 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 etc just to get her way you know manipulating the children manipulating the husband have to be in in, in everything that's going on they're part of their children's life into an abnormally not 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 um not good way they just have to be a part of everything right that's dominant controls the husband controls the money controls decision making controls the children what they do where they go to school um what sports they play and when they gotta go who goes what do what she controls everything that's a dominant wife she has to be in control if she loses control or feel like she's losing control then she use manipulative tactics to make sure that things come back in control and that could be getting sick yeah, getting sick, um, you know, getting tired, feeling tired and getting emotional, crying or stop doing what you, you know, um, doing or just being very aggressive with the mouth. Right. Cursing and carrying on or um, so and that type of thing. And then you have the enabler, the wife that's an enabler, knowing that her husband is cantankerous right he's abusive verbally physically and she just said no it's okay you know he didn't mean it you know um you know after he does that um you know i'll take care of it don't worry you know um you know it's it's probably me that it's the children's fault if your husband is not pleased or happy it's your fault if your husband is not pleased or happy you know it's always someone else's fault whatever the husband tells you is the fault you believe and you just go ahead you don't protect the children. You don't protect yourself. It's like you you just, whatever he wants to do, if he wants to go and be a playboy, oh, it's okay, you know, he didn't really mean it. He loved me. I am the number one, you know, even though he has another girl out there, he says I'm his wife and he would never leave me and he don't really care about her, whatever the case may be. Or if they, if he's not um, paying attention to the children, it's okay. He's busy. He have a lot of work. You know, he works so hard. Whatever lie he tells her, it might be true, but, you know, there's always a way. Whatever the husband says, and if he is tired, if he's hungry, or if he, I mean, I'm sorry, if he's tired, and if he, uh, I'm sorry, not if he's tired. He uses being tired. He uses being whatever so that he can get out of something. And she's always giving him a way out of situation. And then you have the distracted wife. And this is quite like the distracted husband. You know, she's concerned with everybody's business except what goes on in her house. She's concerned about what mama and dad said, mama and them said. She's concerned about what her um, friend's marriage. She's concerned about the children's, uh, the PTA, what's going on in the government, what's going on in the workplace. She's just concerned about what's going on in the in the community. She's just a, a nosy person. She's like we call them. Um, she's the CNN of of the um of the block or the community. She's distracted. She's just in with everything else except what's going on in her house and her husband. You know, and she always find a way. If her husband needs her, oh, I can't because I'm helping mommy or helping your mother. I'm helping this person always doing something for someone else and leaving her house um, un uncared for. She would go and clean up someone else's house or go clean up the pastor's house or do this or make um, put together the party celebration for her boss or for her office. She would decorate the office. But when it comes to our own house, there's nothing there. She's just totally distracted. 
right? That's one example. The emotion, and then the, then the fourth wife, um, dysfunctional wife, um, is the emotion motivated wife. She's totally emotion, like emotional. Everything is emotional. Oh my God, the children are sick. I don't know what to do. I'm a terrible mom. But she gets in a meltdown. So her husband is a way to control every situation. And so she, I don't know what to do. I don't think I'm good enough. If the husband come in and, and, and she burns the food and um, he says, well, may, honey, maybe you should take it out. Just giving her a nice, some constructive criticism or just giving her some advice. You know, just make sure that you turn them, turn the, the, um, the oven down a little more. Turn the oven down, oven down a little more the next time you cook it maybe you're cooking it too high you don't think i could cook you always tell you you talk about your mom your mom cooked better than me that person cooked better than me and she remembers a list of the people that you've complimented and she's using it just so she can be in this emotion in this emotional um state and then of course when she goes out these women is very dangerous because when it comes to keeping up with the joneses they're danger to their family because if the hus if the if the neighbor purchased a new car or a new refrigerator or went shopping and got some sales on something and they're talking about gifts for their child now she's motivated she want to get the same thing because oh i don't want my children to do without and um you know i don't want them to feel like our family is not Oh, I don't want my family to feel that like we're not doing that well and da da da. Whatever emotional, it's just driven, emotionally driven, um, about everything. The husband um try to 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 um do something that will move the family uh forward and this person is emotional like i don't know i don't know if we could do that because the last time someone tried to do that x y and z this happened you know um everything is just emotion motivated motivated everything they do is emotion so she buys you know she makes decision like if her if she sees like um a neighbor's child is in track and field she wants our child to be in track and field. So she's going to be like, you know what? I think you should do track and field. And if the person is not, if the child is saying that she don't want to do it or the girl, the good son don't want to do it. Oh, well, you know, can't you do it for mom? And da, 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 et cetera. All, everything is more, decisions are made by emotion. Major decision is more motivated by emotion. Um, even the smallest decision is made, is motivated by emotion. Everything is just emotional, emotion motivated. More explanation for these destructive destructive wives and husbands is found in this phenomenal book by one of my favorite um, marriage and relationship individual. Oh yeah, Marriage on the Rock by um, Jimmy Evans. Yeah, Jimmy Evans, Jimmy and Karen, of course. Um, his wife, his name is Karen. And so this book, Marriage on the Rock, it's a phenomenal read. And in there talks about the dysfunctional wife, dysfunctional um, husband, what make them a dysfunctional wife and dysfunctional husband. I'm going to be talking about um, my our own experience when we, when we do cover that down in the series and what we've done spiritually. Now, it's not covered in the book, but the book gives great understanding, great understanding of what we're dealing with in our marriage. And so that when we go fasting, when we go praying, we are like surgeons. We're going with knowledge so we know what scriptures to pull out because we're seeing certain evidence in our, our, in our spouse. So for example, with Joel and myself, you know, um, Joel was like the dominant husband, right? He was a dominant husband. So a lot of times I was enabling it. I would just be like, though I was a little bit, you know, my personality is strong. I was like, you know what? Yeah, Sherilyn. After I came to, um, when I was started fighting for my marriage, because I wanted my marriage so much, um, so badly, I was like, okay, I was taking all the problems. I'm like, everything that's happening is could be me. So I was working on myself and everything. So whatever Joel says, whatever, whether it's right or wrong, I was going in and trying to grow myself so that, you know, if this marriage going down, it's not going to be because of Cheryl and I'm going to do my best. But at the same time, he had some dysfunctional behaviors that needed change. He needed to change. And, uh, and after a while, he became very um, like controlling and manipulative and stuff like that. Not uh, not in the, re in the regular sense that people would think, oh, Joel, it's just 
was manipulating, but it was subtle. It's subtle. He just wanted his desired end. So he would say just the right things. And I fell for it. Or I was like, yeah, even if I discerned that he was up to something, I said, okay, he had a long day. You know, he is good at such, such and such. And I would give him a way out. Right. And I would then handle everything because again, I figured that I was home. Um, I'm strong enough. I can handle it because if I wanted to, I could run a company. I could, um, you know, I run a company, um, stay at home and take care of the home and everything. If I wanted to do all that stuff, because I I'm a driver, right? But I figured that, you know, all I have to do is be home. So everything that Joel had to do or should do it, I know, okay, you don't have to do it, honey. You're not ready for it. Let me take care of it all, which was wrong, right? Because what I was doing was enabling him, all right? And not helping him becoming the strong person that he is, which is things that I had to change after a while. Forgive me. My phone should be off. Yes, yes, yes. Decline. All right. So what else? Now let us go in. We are wrapping this up. And so those are the dysfunction. We are a product of what we've, um, what was sown in us. And, and so therefore we sow it in others. So like I mentioned with the dysfunction situation, we are a product. So, and then also opposite the track track. We're going to talk more about the dysfunction wife and the dysfunction husband, what makes them into that? Like what happened in their ancestry or in their, in their, um, in their environment that produce this type of a behavior and then what we can do to get delivered from that. We're going to talk about another time. The answer to stop being, um, to the answer to stop being this basically, um, uh, being that stop dysfunctional person is that we have to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Right. And again, knowing first of all, that who we are in the dysfunction, which wife or her, um, husband, which one of the dysfunction our husband is, which one of the dysfunction we are as wives. And you'll find that the opposite attract. For example, I was the enabling wife. Joel was the dominant husband. So they, the opposite attracted each other. It was a perfect marinade, you know, coming together. However, when healing comes, um, comes about, it's like a phenomenal combination of who we are, right? And so therefore, we're supposed to be tra um, transformed. So with this information, this series is one way of how, and the book is just for you guys to get more knowledge and information. Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be confirmed to this world because this world's telling you that's normal. That's acceptable. It's okay, right? It's not a big deal. Sorry, Sorry guys. I don't know how to take off the stuff. Um, all right, here we go. Yes, do not be transformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God, right? So we want the perfect will of God, the acceptable will, will of God, and the good will of God for our marriage. And in order for us to have that, we have to be renewed. And we as the wife, like I said, I was the one that started off the process. And God said his grace is sufficient. He will give me, he's making, he was making me stronger in me being a helper. Because at this point, I was called to help my husband right? As a helper in, in his healing process. And so when he was healed, now there's a lot of things that he leads. He just leads, you know, he's a phenomenal leader of our home. He leads the children. He leads me. He leads in a, an incredible way. And now it seems like, oh my goodness, now it's I'm, I'm on coast in terms of Spiritually, I know I'm, I'm, I feel the security in where he is in our life right now. I feel secure that I can focus on those things that God called me to do on the outside and not having to be the person that is the priest operating the priest you know, um, way of doing things. Now he is the priest, you know, of the home. He is the leader of the home and not only by his words, his actions, you know, what he does, you know, his surrender to God. Right. And all of this was a process. First, I was in that point place where I can mention you guys, I was doing so much work and it's like, Oh my gosh, whatever the case may be, but God was transforming and renewing me because renew my mind. And then we are going to talk about, I'm going to share a lot of stuff with you guys to renew your mind. So when you go to fast, and pray you're so strategic that you will see your husband transform and change before your very eyes um so god is telling us now how do we renew and change our mind the same discipline god requires us to have in building intimacy with him is the same discipline it will take for us to build intimacy with our with his son your husband 
So God is saying to us and said to me and is saying to you now, the same discipline God himself requires for you to have in order to build intimacy with him is the same discipline it will take for you to build intimacy with your husband, who is his son. So he wants you to build this intimacy. Now, in relationship, of course, the husband might be the stronger one and the wife needs help. He still has to do. He has to partner with God to be able to help his wife be to the same point. In this case, we're talking about us wives who are um, right now petitioning God and we're the stronger one spiritually in the home at this point. Here's what we do. We're supposed the same discipline that it takes for us to build our intimacy with God is going to be the same discipline that it will take to build intimacy with the son of God which is your husband remember that we are spirit soul and body God made provision for all of these needs to be met so our spirit has me our spirit man has needs our soul has needs our body has needs and God made provisions for all these needs and all these needs have to be met right and so what what does that look like God meets all of our spiritual needs. So this is where we're building, discipline ourselves to get to know God, to grow spiritually. He's renewing us, right? He's, he's give, showing us his perfect will for our life and our husband's life. And he's helping us and giving, showing us strategies on how to overcome the wiles and the attacks of the enemy, right? In all the evil days on the earth, right? And so therefore, God, we need to partner. Our spirit man should always be fed. So you're doing good thing because a lot of you who ask, me about this or spoke to me about this you are in the process of always growing and changing and 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 fasting and praying and becoming a better you um with and building your relationship with god which is what, what you got to continue doing and in doing so once you start hearing the, the the voice of the holy spirit and you employ the holy spirit i i truly believe that you cannot do anything without the help of the Holy Spirit. If you don't hear the Spirit of the Lord say it, then you can't do it. And if you're not hearing the Spirit of the Lord, if you're not hearing the Word of the Lord, that means your spirit man is weak and you have to grow your spirit man because our spirit has to be sensitive to the voice of God. The Spirit of God only hears the Word of God because the Spirit of um, the Word of God is spiritually discerned. So we have to make sure that we are growing ourselves is spiritually. And then when we are in need of the things um, to deal with our husbands and our children and how to, to handle the difficult things in life, our spirit man becomes strong in our weakness and is able to guide us, to lead us, sustain us, give us a peace in, in turmoil situation. And so God made provision for us, our spirit man, in his word. So we, we have a steady diet of the word of God so that all of you, a lot of you are part of the, the Bible study. You will come to prayer. You're, you all have the books, the books that we've been recommending. You're reading them. You're growing. And also, I know you're part of, you, you also have other resources that you're listening and growing yourself. You continue to feed your spirit man. Your spirit man is fed only by the word of the living God. It's not by opinions and, um, and revelation of other people you know it is only by the where the the is only by the word of god so we have to read the bible for ourselves we have to we cannot surpass it a lot of people would say you know what you know i don't really have the revelation um that people have that's okay you still have to read the word of god because it's not you it's not by your power or your might but by, but by the spirit of the living god that you're able to do anything so you just need to read the word of God. You may not understand it right now, but you continue reading. You better believe that that spirit of ignorance or whatever it is that that demon is trying to cover you, you're going to get delivered from it. And then eventually, because of you seeking the will of God, seeking ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness through reading his word, then you will see all will be added onto you. So that revelation will be added onto you. Um, you're going to have... Um, illumination you're going to understand the word of god wisdom and understanding will come to you because you're staying the course so stick with it be persistent it's just like pump in the desert right um the, there's a pump in the desert trying to get water and you know as you pump the water the water pressure begins to rise slowly but you're not supposed to give up pumping because the minute you stop pumping the water pressure goes down so you have to pump that water in that desert and hopefully you're thirsty enough to continue to do that whether you're, you're tired or not because you want that water because that water is your source of energy your source of life so you're going to keep pumping 
jump in no matter what tired um you know hands hurting keep pumping the the water in the desert and eventually it's gonna burst burst up and you can't stop the flow it's gonna keep going continually because you've done the work pumping it and that's gonna happen when you keep reading the word of god and you may not be having understanding but you stay the course you just read because god said to read that's it he said meditate upon my word you read it and you meditate on what you can understand or you ask god what does this mean what if there's something that strikes you like you what, why am I, why don't I understand this? I want to know what this means, what this means, because the Holy Spirit is going to make in you, give you an interest in something that you're reading, and you're going to ask questions and allow the Holy Spirit to open it in you. It's falling in love with that process, right? Number two, you know, God meets our spiritual need. Number two, we meet the needs of our soul through knowledge. So our soul is our mind, our will, our intellect, Right. And so for the soul man, the way we think our con um, conscious or subconscious or intellect, right, our reasoning part of us, this is our soul. We meet that need. And how do we meet that need? Again, go back to the word of God. We meet that need through the word of God and also through knowledge. So here is where you're listening to your Kevin L.A. Ewings and your and your Isaiah Saldivar, um, your um. Derek Prince, you know, you're listening to great teachers with revelation. There's so many other, the, 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 the prophet is Tiffany's, whoever you're listening to. And if you're listening to me as well, then you, you're listening to my husband and I on family talk about marriage. Then guess what? You're getting knowledge. You're feeding your soul, you know, which is your mind, your emotions, and your intellect right? That part of you is getting fed from revelation. Yeah, you're reading the word, right? Which, speech, which feeds your spirit, man. And then knowledge is where um, you're gaining knowledge through the revelation that you, you yourself are getting or others are sharing from the word of God. So therefore, here it is. You're feeding, you're, you're responsible for this because you have to go and seek this information take the time out to read these books to look at these um, pre, um um talks by these different people to even gleam and get the knowledge and wisdom that they revelation that they have again that's on you it's in your hands to to go and pursue it when you're home what are you listening what music are you listening to you can you can't serve two masters the music cannot be vulgar and holy at another time you're undoing things so what is it that you're listening to there are a lot of all the genres of music Music, there is there's good positive um or scriptural um songs there 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 are lots of songs that are, are for god that feels feeds our spirit man in a good way in a positive way that are out there what is reggae you like soca you like um whether you like um rap whether you like soul whatever it is or or, or funk or whatever the case would be i remember all the genres country there is something in there that someone is singing the word of god that you can find and so you could have your 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 playlist with all the different kinds of music you like and in there this feeding your soul with the scripture or um the word of god right so we have to look at um what we do in our environment what are we seeing when we look in our house do we have occultic things in the home you know do we have this lot of words and writings that you could find in um the hobby lobby and so on different stores that they have writings of scriptures you could post the scriptures up and decorate your home with the scriptures there's so many things that you could sung around to change your environment right you know different pictures and so on in the home decoration that have those scriptures of god or a picture of the lion of conquering giant lion of judah whatever if you're into painting there's things that you could you can you can have up right to surround you and 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 work on your soul then third you know our husbands if you're married meets our physical needs right so um there's sort of, um our body so our flesh this is our flesh needs so remember we're mind body and soul right and our body so what it is for our care our security uh i mean us feeling love and secured you know um sexual need um you know need um to have fun and enjoy life or whatever the case may be our husband meet those needs those needs in 
in our in the context of marriage so we have need for a conversation our husband's responsibility is to meet those needs right someone we need someone listening to us and talking and having communication and planning on a daily basis with our children we need the husbands to help us in that we can't do that by ourselves right um if we're married you know, this is if we're married or if we have children, we should we should be communication with the children's father to make a decisions with these things. Right. You know, and again, if you're not, you know, it's not God intent for us to not have um, our the children's father in, 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 in the place. Right. So those are things you have to go to God and pray. But right now I'm talking to married women. I'm talking to married women fighting for their husband. So guess what? Your husband, you should be planned in conversation and communication with your husband. That's a need that you have that your husband, only your husband can fill. You shouldn't have conversations with other people concerning your family and, 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 and plans of your children. You know, you can have counsel. No, give me wrong, let me qualify the statement. You could be in counsel with a godly man and a woman that's guiding you and instructing you. However, when it's all done and said and done, the final conversation should be had with your husband in order for anything to move forward in planning for your life, you know, for your marriage in romance and all that stuff. He has to, you have to communicate those things, communicate your needs to him. And he has to be able to listen to your needs and in conversation. Conversation is basically listening to you, hearing what you're saying and really comprehending and understanding what you're seeing. So your husband meets the need for conversation. He meets, he, he, he is the one that is supposed to meet your needs for security, right? So if you're not feeling secure in your fa in your household, it is your husband's um, responsibility to make sure that your children respect you and honor you in the in the context of the home. Because how he treats you, your children will treat you or not treat you, right? And so that's his responsibility, you know. Um, in creating security in terms of your finances, you may be making more money than him, but still, if you guys are making financial decisions together as to what the future will look like, you're going to buy a second home, you're going to build this, you're going to do whatever it is you're looking to do, paying for the children's education, whatever it is, again, he has to have a plan and be, be uh, in communication with you and create a security that he is on the same page with you concerning the decisions you're making. So your husband is responsible for your security in that sense. Your husband is also responsible for your uh, for non-sexual touch, you know, holding, caressing you, you know, uh, making sure that you feel love. That's your husband's responsibility. Romance. That's your husband's responsibility. No one else responsibility. You could try to do these. Send yourself flowers, which is good. You should send yourself flowers because you should love yourself uh, and respect yourself. You know, if it's something that makes you nice and you like flowers, send yourself flowers. If you like cards and your husband's not doing it right then and there, you could send yourself a card, you know, you know, um, you know, just to to, you know, whatever the case may be, however you feel, whatever your love language, you, you want to make sure that you are doing it, that you're, you're giving it to others and then you're receiving it from yourself if you have to in the moment. You know, um, you know, one of the things, my, mine is, mine is um, acts of service. So I would do things for our children. I would do things for my husband because I, I was giving love. And people would love me from different areas. It's always people always wanted to give me stuff. I had a woman that used to just look at me and got my measurements and would build me suits, outfits. And she was incredible from Jamaica. And it was incredible. She was like a, a um, high-end designer. And she would just make me suits when I was in business. And she would just give it to me. So I had a suit like every month and it was just incredible looking suit, great quality. I paid nothing for it. And then um, uh, people used to come and give me books, you know, a lot of Miles Monroe books. I never had to pay for it. So because I was giving of my love language, people would just come and do things for me. They always wanted to help me over, always wanted to help me. I got so much help from people outside of my husband at times, but again, my needs were being met, but my husband is supposed to meet my need, my love. And after a while, when he saw it, he was like, wow, you know, I don't want, I, he gets jealous. Now I don't want these people doing everything for me, you know? So God had to do something, but at, at the end result is that your husband is going to be the one that uh, should and should be the one that is meeting those needs, right? So God makes sure that, and I mentioned that because, Though you might be in deficiency of your love tank being filled, God loves you. He's your husband. He's your first husband. So he's going to ensure he loves you through others. 
to remind you that you're not alone. So your husband may not remember you because you're praying for him still and he's still growing, but God smiles through you, kisses you through so not a person hugs you through something that persons do in your love language. So be mindful of those things and be, be remember to give God praise and thank him. Thank you, daddy. I know that one day my husband's going to be able to do this, but I know that you always do this for me from now until eternity. And I love you for it. Right. So you have that security first from your husband. So remember, God is your first husband. He's going to take care of it. But on 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 this ground, physical, because you're in a marriage, he knows that you have these needs and he knows that your husband is the one, only one physically that is supposed to meet these needs. Right. Um, OK, we are to love God with all our hearts and all our minds. That's the next thing we're supposed to love um, God with all our hearts, and all our minds, which means that. Wherever, because remember, the same discipline required for us to build intimacy with God, with, with God is the same that is um is needed to build with his son. And so his son's responsibility is exactly the same thing, too. So the thing is, whatever we do with God, we're now supposed to do to our husband. Do you guys understand that? So whatever discipline, habits, and behaviors, and relationship we have with God, we now have to transfer that to his son as well. So what we do with God, we do with our, with our husbands. So it doesn't matter what he do, because remember, while we were still sinners, Christ loved us and died for us. And we have to die to ourselves, right? It says love is not self-seeking. So we have to now throw away our need for the moment while we are pursuing our husband. In, in, in the healing in our marriage. And it's a sacrificial thing. But we're not alone because God's grace is sufficient and God is strengthening us and he's going to make it out for us. So number one, we're to love our husband with all our heart and all our mind. We're supposed to love our husband, just love him. And what does that love look like? That love is the agape love as explained in 1 Corinthians 13 and 7, um, um, 13, 4 to 7, which is a love of action. And so we're going to go into that, what that, we're going to do another part of this um, message that talks about how do you live that out? Because I had to live that out after I realized that God's grace was sufficient and God was holding on to me. And he was, while I was getting myself um, grown in the things of God and understand and learn about what a husband and wife look like and what our dysfunctions was and getting delivered in all of that, I still had to love my husband so that he was able to be free. Because one of the things is, is says love, love covers a multitude of sin so the things that my husband was doing whether it be anger if he was immoral if he was calm dominant husband if he was a um distracted husband if he was a passive husband whatever um dysfunction your husband is all of that in our love what we're doing is that we're covering those sins right so our love covers a multitude of sins so when we're living out the agape love we're actually covering the sins of our uh, uh, of our um husband and then we realize that he's going to experience deliverance god's going to be able to deliver us because you the, you two you are one right so whatever you do unto your husband you do unto yourself whatever your husband is doing to you he's doing unto himself so if you're interceding on behalf of your husband you're actually helping your situation right um and then number number two we are to put our husbands first so you remember, he says that God says to put me first. God is the number one commandment is to love thy God with all thy heart, all thy heart and all thy soul and all their might. That means we put God first. He's primary in our life. Now come down into the world, into our marriage, in the marriage structure. We now are supposed to put our husbands first before our children, before our job, before our desires and before ourselves. Because that's what we signed up for. That's why people don't understand the marriage covenant. We don't understand what we signed up for. So when we, once we're in it now to make it work, we have to apply the rules that, that governs it. But the great thing is when we apply the rules, the benefits are incredible. And I'm telling you guys, it is incredible. I do have an incredible marriage. I do have a phenomenal husband. I'm blown away by the husband that I have. Like back in the days, you asked me like, man, this guy, man, I mean, I need more. <laughs> you know what I mean? But now he said, when God gave you, he gives you exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or think, right? 
but that was not always the case. So we are to put our husbands first. So I had to prioritize my husband, his needs. I had to prioritize. I had to prioritize his, his emotions and his feelings and also his healing. Right. And so my his healing was in my hand in that I had to love him. I had to love him because, again, love covers a multitude of sin. And it's the love is explained in 1 Corinthians 34 to 7. It's not that emotional love. You know, it's not that eros love where I'm going to give him sex and calm him down for a moment. You know, we don't do those things. We, we do it with wisdom. We do it with the word of God, right? And understanding. So here we go. You know, we put our husbands first in our marriage. We're to love our husband with all our heart as 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7 describes. And we're to honor, honor and respect our husbands. We to put them first. We put that put our husbands before our children, before all the people, our parents, and so on and so forth. You know, he all he has to be in the first place, right? The Bible says in um Genesis 2:24, it says, For this reason, a husband shall love um shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. We have to leave all relationships to be able to to hold, hold fast and be and, and start this new relationship. A lot of us we left physically but we didn't leave emotionally and so we have to cut soul ties and that's another place where soul ties has to be cut because a lot of times we're failing to cleave or to connect with our husbands or even to um respect him or to put him first because we still have soul ties to other things right and so therefore we honor and respect our husbands we have to honor and respect them just like we honor and respect god god says you know, the beginning of wisdom and knowledge is to fear God, which is to honor and respect God. He says, if you fear me, if you if you fear me, then um, he says, no, he says, sorry, those who fear God will never be put to shame. So when we fear, which we honor and respect God, we will never be put to shame, right? When we are honor and respect our husband, there's no reason for him to disrespect, for he can disrespect us because here he is, he knows he's out of our order. He know he's not even doing half the things. A lot of times, you know, they shame will try to come on them, but he can't put shame on you. He can't tell no one that, you know, this woman is ridiculous or whatever the case may be. He can't put shame on you. He may feel shame because he know he's not, uh, he's not, he don't feel worthy of that honor and respect. But God said we we're supposed to honor and respect him. So we we're going to do what our father says, regardless of if our husband needs it or not. But the thing is, there's a power in what happens. Something is unleashed. In our marriage, there's a power that Satan fears. He quivers when we have it's such it's such a, a sword um, of destruction in 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 the works of the enemy to destroy, to bring dissension, and to bring um, arguments right in our marriage. So I honor and I honor and respect my husband. Why shouldn't he? Now he's my hun, uh, my husband. Because if someone come and try to disrespect him, dishonor him, they have <laughs> they better they better win. Hope I don't pray because when I pray or when I, when I declare the word concerning what they're trying to do, God takes care of the situation. You better believe it. I posted something earlier on the, I don't know if it's in the group or my regular page by Tiffany McGromey talk, talking about, you know, scripture, if husbands and wife understand covenant. You know, there's no need for us to be jealous or concerned because all we have to do is go to, to, to our father, to daddy, run to daddy concerning anything. And then God takes care of the situation. So we are to honor and respect our husbands. Why? Because he's a son of God. He's a child of God. He is God. He's, he's made in the image of God. So when we don't honor and, dis and, and respect him, we're, we're dishonoring ourselves. We're disrespecting ourselves because our husband now, there's an open door where the enemy will come after our husband and come after us. So all the work we're doing, we're undoing just by not obeying what God is telling us to do. And then the last but not least thing we're to do as wives is hold um, hold our husbands accountable to his word, right? And the thing, that's what, because we hold God accountable to his word. God tell us to hold him accountable to his word. So remember, these uh, four things that I gave you is what we do. Like God says, 
the same discipline God requires of us to have to build intimacy with Him is the same um, discipline that God um, that is required for us to build intimacy with our husband. And the goal is is intimacy in our relationship. Why we're having issues and problems is because we're not building intimacy, and intimacy is lacking. And and we were created to have that intimacy and that that love, express that love, right, in our marriage. And so. Number one, we are to love the, the Lord thy God with all our heart and all our soul. We are also to love our husband with all that we have. That agape, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7 love. Number two, we are to put God first, right? And then the same thing, we are to put our husbands first in our marriage, right? He has to be, he says our marriage only works in first place, right? Number three, we are to honor, honor and respect our um god you know god said we, we are to fear god to fear god is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge we are to also fear uh a fear a husband in that we are supposed to honor and respect our husband when we do that i'm telling you there are some powers that are released in our marriage that de debunk satan destroy satan man satan gets so much destruction to the kingdom when we do this one thing and that's why he attacks it so much in marriages right every time you look at the reason why some marriages are failing um in within the marriage that's a place that satan know that that's the, once i get a hold of that and i produce it in the marriage i have a sure success but when you deal with that situation according to the word of god satan is defeated in a worse way and then number four we're to hold our um god accountable to his word god says come remind me of my word he is to be held accountable and he can be held accountable right but we also supposed to hold our husbands accountable we hold him accountable to our marriage vows you know um if he says he's going to do something in terms of uh, for the children we just gently and lovingly remind him well remember we we set out and this is why you're supposed to talk and plan and get what it is that he's looking for and listen and have him lead because dominant women put themselves in trouble dominant wives in that they don't they want to make all the decisions so the husband he has a way out, out of everything he don't have to do anything because he didn't have no say in the first place. So you could go ahead and do what you said. And if what you did failed, that's on you. And then now the woman is stressed and now she's mad at her husband. But you see, if you allow him to lead in that you come together, you give him ideas and he has ideas. And now if you're, if you know your ideas better and he's, he's adamant about his own idea, then you said, okay, then we're going to go with what you says. You know, I'm going to honor that. We're going to do, and you speak just so. He says, I'm going to honor what you says and we're going to go ahead and do what you says right and you make sure you're clear about it that you're going to be going to do what you says and what it is that you're saying up for us to do such and such okay we're going to go ahead and do that because guess what if he and, and also if he said that he's going to do something then he said okay i trust that you will do x y and z now when it's not done and when things are, are are especially when you have issues and so on and there's an argument and um that breaks out. This is not keeping record of wrong. This is just simply bringing up. Remember that we both came to the agreement that we will do what it is that you you want. I, I I chose to honor your decision, and this is the result of this decision. Now, can we revisit it? And maybe maybe if we try what I recommended, maybe that'll work. What do you think? And you get him to give an okay, because at that point he's gonna be like, yeah, we're gonna try. We like let's do what you said right? And he don't feel attacked. You know, you don't have to prove that you were right or nothing, but you're just doing it so that, you know what, you're holding him accountable. And if he says he's going to do something for the children and so on and so forth, don't bail him out. A lot of women bail their husband because he said, no, honey, you don't have to worry, but I'll do it. I'll take care of it. No, have him go and do it. Even if you think he's going to do it wrong. Like you, you even have him change the diaper. If you think he's going to do it wrong, you know, you want to give him the responsibility because some men, unfortunately, because they were wrong, they were not even trained. They were trained to have everything done for them. Right. And, uh, and so you allow them to do things that help you out in the house. Even if in the back of your mind, you're like, Oh my goodness, I'm going to go up to go back around <laughs> and change or fix that. But you say, yeah, honey, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You know, the child's diaper might be over their head, but you say, Oh, thank you so much. I mean, I give you kudos points for trying. Um, I, I mean, I really do appreciate what you're doing. Uh, you know, you can laugh about it, whatever, but then you go and say, let me help you out in this area. Right. After, 
you know, or you just let him do it. If the, the diaper is not fixed properly and he forgot to seal it up and then you get baby, you get baby, um, the baby and you're like, okay, let me put on your clothes and you just slickly neaten it with him not knowing. And that's it. If, if, if it's not to your liking or whatever, but just make you weird to help her husband's self image. We're actually help them because a lot of the times it's been broken down by life. It's broken down by their parents. It's broken down by their they're um, backing on also they're being harassed by demonic spirits day in day out and so we are coming in as the helpmate and do it by just help the actually having them be held accountable for wor their word and what it what it is that they say all right guys so that's it. it is almost two hours with this again there's so much on this topic and so i am so help i'm um, grateful for the opportunity i hope it makes sense you guys can go through listen to it like five five different settings sittings but anyway i want to thank god for each and every one of the the wives that are choosing lord god to to fight for their marriage father god you are the alpha and omega you are the man of war and you are willing to fight for them you said in your word in psalm 35 that you will pick up shield and buckler and fight for the for us and so lord god we know we're not wrestling against flesh and blood enemy we're not wrestling against our husband but we are wrestling uh fighting against spirit wicked spirits we, we're wrestling against principalities we're wrestling against powers against rulers of darkness of this age and against spiritual wickedness on, in the heavenly realm and so lord god we know you know all things because you've created all these um these uh hierarchy of the kingdom of, of, of darkness. And so therefore they have to honor what you say. And you said that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Lord. Everyone has to bow before the Lordship of Jesus. And Jesus is the word because it's written in John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so we thank you that your word, once we use the word of God, which is the sword, which is the part of the our, our armor that is the only tool that we use to fight when we use the word of God to fight against the enemy's wiles, then we know, Father God, that we will have victory. And so we thank you for your word that says your intention is for marriage. Marriage is good and that the, and the marriage bed is undefiled. Your word says that you're not good for a man to be alone and you made him and, and helped me. And so we thank you that it is good. It was your desire for us to be married. And your father says, well, two or more can, I'm sorry, what you put together, no one can put um pull apart. And Father God, you you said you don't like divorce, you hate divorce, um um with one provision out of it. But you are still able to do all things, and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So if we, no matter where our marriage is, if we will to seek Your will for our marriage, Lord God, we know that Your will is always good, and You have a way to deliver us out of situation. We know that You know the end from the beginning and if this is the husband and wife now you know the, the marriage is is to to be saved lord god i know that you will equip every wife you will equip her with the word and you will equip her with every word um uh, instructions necessary to guide her and to lead her in the path that you've calling her for that she could be the favor of her husband because he will open his eyes lord jesus open their eyes so their husbands could see god just like when um Paul Saul was on his way to the road on, on the road of Damascus on the, the road on the way to Damascus and he had a uh, he was he was on fire in pride Lord God of what he thought was best sometimes our husbands they're on fire in pride thinking that they know what's best right God and so therefore just like what you did for Saul um Saul on the way to um, Damascus, I thank you that you're doing this for our husbands, that you are going to meet them in the place that you the desire is not for them to be destroyed, but you are destroyed. The, your, your, your desire is for them to be delivered, for them to have that hope and that future that you've promised. Your promise to our husband is that he will prosper and be in good, um, good, good, he will be in good to prosper and be in good health as his soul prosper and that you remember that you have a future and a hope for him and that those are your thoughts towards him. So I thank you that those thoughts will become um, manifested in our husband's heart. And so on that road, Lord God, interfere, intervene, touch our husband's heart as your word said in Ezekiel 36, 26, that you will give us a heart of flesh. Give our husbands, all our husbands that have hardened heart, give them a heart of flesh, Lord God, and renew in them a right spirit. Lord 
Lord God, we're thanking you like on that road, wherever they're, they're headed, if their habits and their behaviors is leading them to divorce or or um or, or, or for us marriage to be broken apart or to bring this task, this disaster or destruction to them. Father God, we're asking for this intervention right now and that the scales of the other uh, are removed from our husband's eyes in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ over our husband's eyes right now that the scales are removed in the name of Jesus Christ and that our husbands will see, Lord God, that the spirit that you'll defeat the Leviathan, that you will sling hook Leviathan's neck and gut Leviathan by scaling him and gutting him, that that spirit, that twisting spirit, that lying spirit, that twists our conversation for argument is now debunked and destroyed in the mighty name of Jesus. Every hex, every vex, every lying word, every word of that was spoken against our marriage must fall to the ground and bear no fruit in the mighty matchless name of Jesus. No weapons forged against our marriages will prosper and every tongue that raised up against our husband's heart and against our heart, we condemn now in the name of Jesus. We, we send the blood of Jesus Christ to speak to any altar that was erected in our ancestry that all those, um, all those altars that are speaking anti-marriage and divorce and destruction to our marriage we send the blood of Jesus that speaks greater things than the blood of Abel to neutralize to stop to shut the mouth of every altar that is speaking out against these marriages now in the name of Jesus Father God we thank you Lord God we bless you we thank you for deliverance in these marriages we thank you for healing we thank you that hearts are open we thank that eyes are open we thank you for revelation we thank you for healing to come forth speedily we thank you for a plan of action we thank you Lord God for holistic um, a holistic vision of every marriage that they will see the purpose that you've planned for them them, Lord God, and reveal these things in this earth now in the name of Jesus, because your word says that anything you're doing, you do, you do, it's done speedily. Because Lord God, you are Alpha and Omega. You are not in space. You're outside of time and space. Time don't have anything on you. What take men to do um, for? generations of centuries to do you can do in a minute in a second and so we thank you lord god for your omnipotence we thank you for your omniscience your all-knowing power you are el rohai the one who sees you are um your your omniscient the one who knows all and so i thank you lord god that you know the end from beginning for every marriage that is represented every wife that is chosen to stand in the gap i join my faith with her now and i thank you lord god that you're giving her strategy that you're opening the eyes of our understanding that you are soothing her heart and healing and mending her heart even now and giving her the strength in her weakness Lord God become strong I thank you Lord God that your grace is sufficient for her in her process Father God I thank you that the tools and the weapons necessary for her will come forth she will be armed Lord Jesus and ready for battle I thank you Lord God that you're doing this because you are the man of war and you've called us to be warriors in the name of Jesus we are in an army now and we've overcome because the one at the head is Jesus Christ of Nazareth and Jesus is Yahshua Hashem, Shia, the conquering line of Valor, Val um, the conquering line of Judah. I thank you Lord God that he called us to be mighty men and women of valor. We are women of valor and we right now suit and outfit ourselves with the helmet of salvation and the, the belt of truth. We put on the redness of the gospel of peace sandals. Father God we put on the breastplate of righteousness. We pick up our shield of faith that is able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy and the sword of the spirit which is the word of the living God and we stand right now interceding for one another you said, I haven't done all, all to stand. Stand therefore in prayer and petition with all manner of, of prayer and, uh, and, and utterance in the name of Jesus. And so, Lord God, we thank you that we are armed for the battle and that you're renewing our mind. You're renewing our heart in Christ Jesus. We are not afraid of the works of the enemy. We are not. You said to take courage and, and because the Lord thy God is with us. Do not be dismayed for the Lord is with us. So I thank you, Lord God, for the courage and the faith in these young ladies that they're able to stand in you knowing boldly that their husband is the mighty man of war that you answer by fire and isn't your word like hammer that break into pieces the rock isn't it like fire that burn and quench every fiery um host and i thank you lord god that you are sending out your angels giving them arm charges over each husband each a wife and their household and these angels are bearing them up lest they dash their foot at the foot against the stone father god we thank you that you are indeed 
the man of war. Thank you for su surrounding each marriage right now with the fire of God that anything that the enemy try to come against them with, he will flee in seven different ways in confusion. Let confusion come upon every man and woman that is speaking evil against every, re every relationship and every marriage under the sound of my voice today. Lord God, I thank you that all their plots, plans, and skills, scheming will come to confusion. I thank you, Lord God, that the fear of God will grab them and arrest them to the point of repentance. Lord Jesus, we thank you that the will of God will manifest in each and every marriage's representative today. Man and woman will stand by, side by side in the power and the might and the revelation and the knowledge and the understanding and the wisdom of the living God. We thank you, Lord God, for discernment in these marriages, that they're discerned the wiles and the attacks of the enemy, and they will come to you. They will seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness, that all be added unto them, them individually, their marriage to bring intimacy, and their children to bring fruit, fruitfulness. I thank you, Lord God. Your word says, because these women are standing, Lord God, and they're being, they're seeking your word, and they fear you because they fear you and they love your commandments. You said, mighty shall be their children in the land. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. So no matter what is going on in their marriages, their children will not, but will not be beneficiary of the, of the brokenness, but the children will be healed and delivered and sanctified under the blood of Jesus. And whatever it is that need to repair in the marriage, it will not affect the children for the seed of the righteous shall be deliver whatever the enemy is meaning to plan and plot against the lives of their children i cancel now in the name of jesus and these children will live out their days to fulfill their god-given assignment i think oh that's good to hear yes man you guys are at advantage i mean i always encourage singles if you're a single share this with a single friend said yes you're hearing it from marriage but if you get this information you will know how to prepare yourself so when a guy come talking fool like Kevin said, when they come and they and they don't line up with the word of God and you know what you're looking for. And even if you're going out with a person right now and they have certain habits and behaviors, like they can be um, in alignment with one of the, the potential to be one of those dysfunctional husbands, then you know what you need to do. You need to listen to the series as they continue. And also you want to identify yourself. Are you a dominant wife? You have, do you have a potential to be one of those destructive wives? And if you are, then you know something that you could bring before the Lord and fast and pray, breaking those things and getting deliverance from it so that you will attract the right person. Because remember, we attract who we are, not who we want. God bless you and have a great day. Mm -hmm. oh, it's not ending. There we go.